Welcome to week 18. It is after the final exam has ended. There's no attendance today. It's a great chance to enjoy the pure joy of literature with no external pressures or other concerns. So today we're going to look at five of Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, and I asked the class what you guys wanted to do. Do you want to discuss them or hear me talk about them? And they said they want to hear me talk about them. So I'm going just to talk. So uh, let's look at the first one. Why do you think the ending of Sonnet 30 is either sincere or just conventional? Does Shakespeare mean it or is that simply how people expect him to end the sonnet. So sonnet 30. Uh, since it's just me talking, um, we can go into much more detail about uh, each sonnet. So when to the sessions of sweet silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past. So he here the speaker is remembering the past. By the way, remembrance of things past is the Chinese, uh, sorry, the English title for uh, the really big novel by Marcel Proust. The remembrance of things past. So when I remember the past, I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought. So throughout my life, I have searched for many things. And there are many things that I did not find, that I did not get. And with old woes, new wail my dear time's waste. So along with my past sadnesses and failures, I now add some new failure, how much time in my life I have wasted. Then can I drown an eye unused to flow? Flow means tears. So I'm not used to crying, but at this moment I do cry. For precious friends hid in death's stateless night, I cry for old friends who are now dead. Stateless night, right? So it's not a night you can count. It's a forever night. And weep afresh love's long since cancelled woe. So for past love, right, that has long since ended, uh, the sadness that I thought was over have come back afresh, and I cry for them once again. And moan the expense of many a vanished sight. So many things that have already disappeared, I I am sad about their disappearance once again. So when he's remembering his life, he's remembering all of these sad things. Then can I grieve at grievances foregone? Oh, this one's interesting. A grievance is like a grudge. It's something you you are angry at somebody about. But he says that giving up, foregoing, giving up these grievances makes him sad. I grieve for them. So the revenge I did not take makes me sad. And heavily from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of four bemoaned woe, uh, moan. So all of these sad things I talk about one by one again and again, which I knew pay as if not paid before just like I had never talked about them before. So up to this point, the poem is basically the speaker in the middle of night, thinking about all of the bad stuff in his life. Kind of like the Taylor Swift album Midnights, right? Each song is a bad memory or an older memory. But then we get the ending. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, so if in this moment I then think of you, my friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. All the bad stuff 
it all they all come back to me. It doesn't matter. My sadness ends as soon as I think of you. Uh, and we should note that friend can also mean lover. It means somebody intimate, somebody close. So the question is, is this ending sincere or is it just something that we expect? The whole thing is sad, right? Every line gives us something sad in the speaker's life that he thinks about. And it seems like the speaker is just enjoying reliving these sad moments, these lost friends, these missed opportunities, things he has not done, revenge he has not taken. That seems to be mostly what this poem is doing. But then at the very end, it says, but when I think of you, none of this matters. I'm no longer sad. On the one hand, it could be sincere, right? There's a there's an effect in this poem. The first 12 lines are all sad, but then the ending gives us a twist. And the the power of this poem lies in the contrast. The sadder the first part, the more happy the second part. On the other hand, we don't really know anything about this friend except that it's a close friend. The previous 12 lines are full of details, not just sadness, but different kinds of sadness, not just um, like people I used to love, but how the love comes back just like it's brand new and makes me cry once again. The language of the first 12 lines is much more detailed and concrete than the last two lines. So it could be, it does feel like, Shakespeare knew that the sonnet needed a twist. And the most logical twist is, oh, the whole thing is sad, then I'll give you a happy ending. It does feel like the point of this poem is the sad part. And the happy part is simply conventional. Um, but either way, we do get the emphasis on the form, 形式, the 重点. Whether it's sincere or not, we can tell that the structure of this poem is very carefully crafted. We say that the Shakespearean sonnet goes to 12 lines and then there's a twist in lines 13 and 14. But even in the middle of the first part, usually two lines make a unit and four lines make a unit. So the first two lines are about the situation. The second two lines are about what the speaker does. And the first four lines set up all of the sad things in the rest of the poem. Right, so the fifth line, we get the idea of crying. Line six, dead friends. Line seven, ended romances. Line eight, all the other stuff that has disappeared. So this, these four lines are all about people that are no longer here. Uh, and then the next four lines, uh, revenge I did not take, uh, sad accounts of things in the past, which I knew pay as I have not so, and then how I moaned them again. So these four lines are about things. So like in the structure, even though there only seems to be two parts, Every four lines makes up its own small unit of meaning. And we should note that this is sonnet 30. The sonnets, the order of the sonnets is. OK, so the sonnets were published, so we do have a fixed order. That's why each number is so certain, right? There's no square brackets around the number. The editor does not have to guess the number of the sonnet. So the order is certain. What we don't know is why are they in this order? It looks like there might be a story going on through some of the sonnets, but then in other sonnets, there is no story. It may, seems like some of the earlier sonnets are not as good as the later ones, but that's also not 100% true. We don't know why the sonnets are in this order. 
But it does feel like this sonnet is not as powerful as some of Shakespeare's other work. So we can keep reading the other four sonnets to compare. Number two, who do you think sonnet 62 is addressing? Who is the speaker talking to? And how can you tell? Uh, OK, so we're skipping one. I'll come back to 35 later. 62. Sin of self love possesses all mine eye. OK, so it looks like this is about self love. But it's called a sin, something bad. Possesses all mine eye, so all I can see is my love for myself. So it looks like this is not about confidence. Looks like it's about vanity. Zilian. All I see is myself. It possesses all mine eye and all my soul and all my every part. So I'm literally full of myself. Right in English, full of myself means da. But literally, that's what Shakespeare is saying. I'm full of myself. And for this sin, there is no remedy. There's no cure. It is so grounded inward in my heart. This vanity comes from so deep within me that I can't. There's no way to stop it. Methinks no face so gracious is as mine. So I have the best face. No shape so true. I have the best body figure. No truth of such account. Um, so when I say that my body has the best figure, I am telling the most truthful truth. Account just means the, the content, the detail. And for myself, mine own worth do define as I all other in all worth surmount. And I say what I am worth, right? I define my own worth. And the way I define it is that I am better than everyone else. Surmount means overcome, be higher than. So in my eyes, I am better than everyone else. But when my glass, glass here is a mirror. When my mirror shows me myself indeed, Indeed here means actually. So up to line eight, he's thinking about himself, how much he loves himself, how much he loves the way he looks. But when I look in a mirror to actually look at myself, beaded and chapped with tanned antiquity, uh, antiquity. Antiquity here means old age. So he's saying that his skin is beaded. It has suffered a lot. Chapped means dry. So you can say like his skin is wrinkled and dry with tanned antiquity tan. A tan is uh, when your skin becomes uh, harder and the color becomes darker. So over the years he has grown darker and harder. His skin has gotten worse. When he sees this, mine own self love quite contrary I read. So I see things that are opposite to my vanity. Self so self loving were iniquity. So in that case to continue to love myself would be unfair. Iniquity is unequal, which means unfair. I think right number 12. It would be wicked. OK, so it would be bad for the self to love such an aged and unattractive self. So seeing my true self, if I kept on loving myself, that would be a bad thing. Tis thee, it's you, myself, that for myself I praise, painting my age with beauty of thy days. So when I say I love myself, it's you. you uh, it looks like he's talking to himself. It's you that I praise, and it's you who painting my so he's old age right now, right? So painting my age with beauty of thy days. Thy means yours. So you're painting my old age with the beauty of your days. Your here meaning my own younger days. So he's saying when I praise myself, 
I'm actually praising my younger self instead of my current old age. Again, very clear structure. The first four lines are about vanity. The next four lines are about the really narcissistic self image, the, the self that he has an idea of and that he loves so much. The next four lines were about what he really looks like. And then finally he's saying, so when I praise myself, I'm actually praising my younger self. So the question here is, who is he talking to? It looks like he's talking to himself, right? It's you, myself, my younger self. But if he's really talking to himself, why does he need to write the poem? Is it perhaps he's actually talking to his older self? It's like he's 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 performing a dialogue between himself and his younger self in order to tell his current self not to be so vain and really love the idea of himself. In Chinese, 他跟年轻的自己对话，借以这个方式提醒现在的自己不要那么自恋。Something like that. And three, why would you accept the apology of Sonnet 110? Okay, let's take a look at that. Alas, which means I, uh, tis true, I have gone here and there and made myself a motley to the view. So I have gone about, I have spoiled my own image. I've made myself a fool in the eyes of the world. Gored mine own thoughts. I've spoiled my own thoughts. I've wound, wounded my own thoughts. Okay. Sold cheap what is most dear. Dear means expensive or like valuable. And yet I treated them cheaply. Ah, okay. So in fact, this comma is explaining, the second half is explaining the first half. What does it mean to wound my own thoughts? It means to sell cheaply what is most valuable. So what is most valuable? His thoughts, his ideas are most valuable. And so by selling them cheaply, it's like he has wounded his own ideas. He has hurt his own ideas. Made all the fences of affections new. So I've made a new friend or a, like a maybe a new lover. And I have hurt them in the same way that I hurt my old friends and old lovers. Old offenses, old mistakes. Most true it is that I have looked on truth askance and strangely. So when I have been faced with the truth, I haven't trusted it. Askance means sideways. I look sideways at the truth. Strangely here means from a distance or like it's something else. It's different. So I have not faced the truth. I have not really taken that truth in. I have not tried to understand it. But by all above, so this is a swear. It has a fasu. He's swearing by heaven. These blenches gave my heart another youth. So all of these mistakes made me young again. And worse essays prove thee my best of love. Essay means attempt. And make so like a worse essay could be like making these mistakes have proved that you are my best love. Very interesting. We start to get a picture of the kind of lover that the speaker is imagining or that the speaker thinks the other person is. Now all is done. This is also a, a very famous phrase that we still use today. All is done. Everything's over. Have what shall have no end. 
Um, so now that everything's over, the subject is unclear, but I think it means I. I have what you'll have no end. I have something that will never end. Nine. Uh, mine appetite I never more will grind on newer proof. I OK, so to grind something. Um, here I'm thinking about like sharpening a knife. A professional knife sharpener will have a stone wheel that they will turn and they will put the knife on the wheel that that is called grinding the wheel. So to grind on newer proof, I will no longer test my appetite on each new situation. Appetite here probably means desire. So line 10 to 11 kind of means I will no longer like test whether I still have desire, test whether I am a romantic man on every new woman that I meet. So I will no longer cheat on you, basically. Uh, I never more will grind to try an older friend. Try here means test. Uh, so I won't keep testing you. A God in love to whom I am confined. You are my God of love and I am restricted to you. Confined means restricted. Then give me welcome next my heaven the best. Next my heaven the best means next to heaven uh, next to my heaven the best so you are the best thing except for heaven heaven obviously is the best thing but you are the next best thing so give me welcome let me back into your life even to thy pure and most most loving breast so let me back into your heart not just your life so what is this poem about it's true, I have gone about to make myself a fool. I have made myself cheap. I have made my own ideas cheap. Here ideas are probably ideas about love. So I keep saying love is pure, love is beautiful, but then I keep cheating on you. I have made old offenses of affections new. So I've cheated on people before, uh, and I also cheated on you. So same mistake for new people. It is true that I know it's wrong, right? This is the truth. I should not cheat on my lovers, but I I didn't really accept this truth. I didn't really face this truth. But I swear that doing these things, cheating on people made me young again. And the fact that you're uh, and by, you know. Uh, sleeping with many different women, I have discovered that you are the best woman for me. Right. Trying worse things proved you the best. And here he means trying worse women have proved that you are the best for me. But now that I'm done, I'm not going to cheat anymore. I'm done. Uh, we have what shall have no end. Our love can continue with no end in sight. I never more will uh, try my desires on newer people. I will no longer test you, my old friend because you are my uh, the God of love and I am restricted to you. Therefore, let me back into your heart because you are the next best thing to heaven. So the question is, would you accept this apology? Personally, no, <laughs> it's a terrible apology. Like, yes, he does say that I cheated on you and I was wrong, but then he says, Cheating on you made me young again. I only discovered you were the best woman after cheating on you. This does not sound like a very uh, sincere apology. It's kind of saying I had to cheat on you in order to realize that we had a good relationship. And so now I want to keep the relationship that we have. And I will no longer like cheat on you. I will no longer test your patience. And I am confined to you. I am restricted to you. Today we say if you're stuck in your room, we say you are confined to your room. Not a very positive word, right? It's not saying I only want to be with you. It's saying I can only be with you. 
So like this then, which means therefore, makes no logical sense. Because you are the best woman for me, therefore welcome me back. It's an entirely selfish apology. However, this is Shakespeare. So not everything is exactly as it looks on the surface. Is it possible? Because look, it says, I never more will grind on your proof to try an older friend. I won't do this again. And the woman is still here or the addressee is still here, probably a woman. There is some speculation Shakespeare may have been gay. We don't know, but probably a woman. She's still here. She's still listening to him. And in fact, she probably knows that he cheated on other people, right? Because uh, he, he here says these are old offenses. I have cheated on people before. And she probably knows this. So even though he's a cheater, even though she knows that he has cheated on her, she's still here listening to the apology. So there must be some part of her that doesn't want to lose him. So in fact, the this apology could in fact work because it is such an honest apology. It's not like uh, she thought he was the perfect man, right? It looks like she already knew he was the kind of man who cheats. And yet she's still here. So, you know, she recognizes that he's this kind of man. So it doesn't help if he tries to pretend to be a better man. Because he's not. So in fact, by being so honest about his thinking, by being so honest about his feelings, this apology could in fact work. The thing about cheating, there are two things about cheating on people. The first thing is, of course, the breaking of trust. I trust that we will be exclusive, that we will only date each other. And you break that trust when you cheat on me with somebody else. But the second part is. Continued trustworthiness. Now that you have broken my trust once. How can I trust you in the future? So like if the speaker of this poem said, you're right, I cheated, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. That addresses the first point, I broke your trust. But it doesn't address the second point, which is how can you trust me in the future? Because if she knows that he cheats and he just says, OK, I'll stop, I won't do it again. That doesn't really uh, say anything about why she should trust him in the future. But by apologizing like this, he not only admits he's a cheater and he cheated in the past, he also admits he cheated on previous lovers, and he also explains why he no longer will cheat. And the explanation is entirely selfish, and so we can guess that it's an honest explanation. So even though it looks like a selfish apology, what he's actually doing is trying to show his lover that she can trust him in the future because he is now so honest. He's so honest that he's willing to show how selfish he is. So when he says, I won't cheat on you anymore, you can trust him. Does that make sense? So, you know, uh, it, the difference I think is between how well these two people know each other. If they've only been together for like a month, this probably wouldn't work, but it seems like they know each other quite well. And in that case, this apology could be successful. This is a good reminder when you write your essays in a writing class, it's not enough just to have good content and good grammar. You also have to make the reader trust you. You also have to make the reader want to read what you write. And sometimes the way to make the reader trust you is to make yourself look bad. Because who would willingly make themselves look bad? The only reason somebody would make themselves look bad to you 
is if they trust you. And if the author trusts you as the reader, you are more likely to trust the author also. Oh yeah, I forgot to say in the last one. Uh, he thinks he's so perfect and then he looks in the mirror. This is why Taylor Swift says she would look into the sun but never into a mirror. OK, uh, sonnet no number 129, question four. Why do you think this sonnet was written before sex or is it after sex? 129. The expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action. Expense just means spending it. So the expense of spirit is using up my spirit in a waste of shame. So it's wasting my spirit in a shameful way. This is lust in action. Lust, of course, means sexual desire. So it's saying that uh, following my sexual desire is a waste of my spirit and it is shameful. And till action, lust is perjured murderous bloody full of blame savage extreme rude cruel not to trust so if you don't follow your lust or i guess i if i don't follow my lust if i don't turn my lust into action then the lust is okay perjured means lied against somebody is lying about you so in, in other words it means it feels angry and wants to take revenge. And then it describes uh, unfulfilled lust as murderous. Bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme. Rude. So rude uh, today just means impolite. But in those days, rude was a stronger word because in the old days, etiquette was much more important. So rude doesn't just mean impolite. It means like breaking social expectations. It means like not uh, be doing what you are supposed to do as a person in your class. It's a much stronger word. Cruel, not to trust. Enjoyed no sooner, but despised it straight. So as soon as you fulfill lust, you will hate it. Straight means straight away, which means immediately. Past reason hunted. And no sooner had past reason hated as a swallowed bait on purpose laid to make the taker mad. Ah, okay, so madly intemperately. Ah, okay, so past reason means beyond reason. Hunted beyond reason, even doing so irrationally. You chase desire irrationally, and no sooner have you hated lust irrationally, just like you take the bait that has been laid there to make you mad, make you insane. So it's like your desire is there and it drives you mad so much that you will do nothing to uh, will do anything to fulfill that desire as soon as you fulfill your desire no sooner right as soon as you do what desire wants you to do mad in pursuit and in possession so uh, so when you're chasing desire you're insane when you have grasped desire you are insane as soon as you fulfill it had having and in quest to have extreme. Uh, so in the past when you're chasing it, in the present when you're enjoying it, in the future when you're searching for it, all of these uh, mindsets are extreme. A bliss in proof and proved a very woe. 
So here it's saying like when you have the result of your desire, when you're enjoying the desire, it is pure happiness, pure bliss. But once you have enjoyed it afterwards, it is a great sadness. Before a joy proposed behind a dream. So when desire stands before you, it is a happiness that is offering itself to you. But after you leave desire behind, it becomes nothing more than a dream. All this the world well knows, yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. So everyone knows this about desire. But even though everyone knows this, people still chase after it, even though it is a heaven that leads men to hell. So the question is, do you think that the speaker is talking before he had sex or after he had sex? Before he could enjoy his desire or after? I think it's after, right? The last line, oh, sorry, the, this line, line 12. Before, that's not a good line either. Uh, line 11, a bliss in proof and proved a very woe. So as you're enjoying it, it's happy, but after you're finished with your desire, it is a great sadness. And look at what most of this poem is saying. Desire, uh, des desire is a waste of spirit. It's uh, vengeful, murderous, bloody, blameful, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust, straight away despised. It's like bait. It drives you insane. Very extreme. Such a negative poem about desire seems like it was written when the speaker feels like desire is a bad thing. And according to the poem itself, that would be after enjoying desire. So it seems like this poem was written after sex. Because like if it, were, if it were written before sex, it would probably be like, oh, you know, you're such a beautiful lady and I love you so much and my heart is full of love for you and we must enjoy our time together. All of these positive romantic ideas. But here this poem treats lust and love as very negative. Um, and in fact, this is only this is one of the few classical poems to talk about love and lust in this negative way. And that's that's why I chose it. It shows Shakespeare's observation and creativity. Most love poems are about how love is beautiful. This is not a love poem. It's a lust poem. And it's about how lust is terrible. Very uh, unique choice of subject. Uh, and and like it also shows off Shakespeare's vocabulary. So many different ways to describe the evils of lust. Actually, OK, and then we can look at the structure. This one is uh, the structure is looser. They, right, we're already up to Sonnet 129. There seems to be a development in the form. Um, so like this is the main idea. And then up to here, the lines three and four, we have a list of negative descriptions of lust. Line five, it's still a negative description, but it's not one word anymore. Uh, and then we talk about time. Right in line three and four, these are static descriptions, Jing Tai Miao Shu. But starting from line five, we have the element of time, no sooner. Uh, and then hunted, hated, these are all actions. A swallowed bait. So th these four lines have the element of time. And then starting in line nine, we also have a contrast between pursuit and possession wanting it and having it. Uh, so we have the comparison of how wanting it drives you mad, but after you have it, you think it's a terrible thing. Uh, and then finally, the twist is even though it's lust is such a terrible thing, all men still try to chase their lust. Um, this is also a very stereotypical male poem. 
it's a very stereotypical way of understanding male lust. Female lust has more different shapes, more different trajectories, Guiji, more different me, uh, um, pacing in development. Because, like, you know, this poem about male lust is kind of like you're climbing the mountain and then you really want to get to the top. And then after you get to the top, you start going down and you feel like, oh, why did I climb this mountain? It's very linear, very uh, xian But female lust uh, is often described using circles. You don't always get to the center of the circle, but the circle itself can be quite meaningful. So this is a very male poem. And then line five. Are these love poems? Sonnets are traditionally love poems. Are these love poems? Well, we skipped one, so let's go back to Sonnet 35. Um, and if you entered the classroom late, these sonnets are at the end of the handout. Thirty-five. No more be grieved at that which thou hast done. So the thing that you did, the thing that you have done, don't be so sad about it anymore. Roses have thorns and silver fountains mud. So even a beautiful flower has thorns, even a fountain of silver made of silver at the bottom, there is mud. Clouds and eclipses stain both moon and sun. So even something as bright as the moon and the sun are sometimes covered by clouds, are sometimes covered by eclipses. And loathsome canker lives in sweetest bud. A canker is a sore. A can okay, sorry, it's a canker worm. It's a kind of bug. And uh, even in the sweetest flower, you can find bugs. All men make faults, and even I in this. So in this situation, I myself did something wrong. Authorizing thy trespass with compare. Uh, so I was wrong in letting you make a mistake. Trespass means to make a mistake. Uh, trespass technically means to enter an area that you're not supposed to enter. So this mistake is probably a social mistake. You did something to somebody else that they did not want to have happen. So you like you entered their private space. You made a mistake. Uh, so my mistake is by comparing with you, I have um, legitimated your mistake. My self-corrupting, solving thy amiss. Amiss is also a mistake. Solving is healing. So by doing this, I have corrupted myself in order to help heal you. Excusing thy sins more than thy sins are. I have forgiven you for more than your mistake. So your mistake was probably not big, but I have given you a lot of forgiveness. I have forgiven you more than your mistake needs to be forgiven. And so by doing this, I am also making a mistake. For to thy sensual fault, I bring in sense. Oh, this is a great line. So your mistake is observable. People can tell that it's a mistake. But in order to see that it's a mistake, I have to use my sense, right? Sensual fault, sense. So it's saying I am also partly to blame for this mistake because I'm showing people that it is a mistake. Thy adverse party is thy advocate. So the person blaming you is also the person supporting you. This is from the court of law. Adverse party is the person who is against you in 
a lawsuit and the advocate is your lawyer, the person who is arguing for you. And therefore against myself, a lawful plea commence. So when I blame you, I'm also blaming me. Commence means begin. So again, we're still in the court of law. Uh, so when I blame you in this court of law, I'm also blaming myself. Such civil war is in my love and hate that I an accessory needs must be to that sweet thief which sourly robs from me. So he's calling the person a thief who robs from me, and yet I at the same time must be an accessory or an accomplice, somebody who helps. Accomplice. But notice that he, he calls them a sweet thief who sourly robs from me. That's a nice contrast, right? And then it says that the fault is a sensual fault. Sensual can also mean like uh, uh, having to do with love. And then they, we have comparisons with flowers, right? Roses, bud. So in fact, this poem seems to be talking about a lover. Like my lover has done something wrong to me, but because I love her, so I forgive her more than she deserves to be forgiven. And therefore I am making, I am offending myself. I'm not standing up for myself. I'm supporting the person that, I, that uh, offended me simply because I love her. So like, is this a love poem? It does seem to be a love poem. Even though we don't have the word love, we don't see the word romance. We don't have like the word beautiful. We only have small hints, sweet, roses, sensual. Um, but it does seem to be saying, uh, even though you uh, offended me because I love you so much, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to forgive you so much that it's probably not a good idea. I'm probably doing something wrong forgiving you so much. Uh, as Confucius said, we should not return evil with kindness. But that's what the speaker is doing. Well, what about the other four poems? Are they love poems? 30, he's saying, um, in the dead of night, I, I keep remembering all the shit in my life. But when I think of you, my dear friend, all of my sadness ends. So if you believe that this is a sincere ending, then it does seem like a love poem. It's saying that my love for you is so powerful that it can overcome all of these negative thoughts and memories. Uh, and then Sonnet 62, talking about how I love myself, but when I look in a mirror, I'm not actually that beautiful, could also be a love poem to himself. Right, he's talking to how he, he loves his younger self so much. 110, I'm sorry I cheated on you, definitely a love poem. Even if it doesn't praise the lover so much, but the fact that he's willing to be so honest is itself a compliment to his lover. It's saying, I trust that you will receive my honesty. So by being so honest, he's actually praising his lover. Uh, in Chinese, 就是那个你人这么好,有品是一个大好人,我相信你能够接受我这一份诚意。Right, so it's the And then 129 is a poem about lust. Uh, and in order to fulfill, in, traditionally, in order to fulfill lust, you have to have a lover. If you fulfill lust by yourself, that is a sin uh, in Christianity. Yeah, so it does seem like these five poems can be understood as love poems. Um, they're not traditional love poems, 
they're not always primarily about love. But love is a part of every one of these poems. And again, that's part of the genius of Shakespeare. He doesn't just do the traditional thing. He uses traditional forms and ideas to develop things in new directions. He opens up the possibility of the sonnet form. And so after Shakespeare, people started more and more to write love poems about less traditional things, sometimes not even about love or using love as an excuse to discuss other ideas. OK, do you have questions about these five poems? OK, so that's the ending of the lecture part of this class, um, but there are still some things I wanted to discuss with you.